in the photography, as in physics, an inverse square law is any physical law stating that a specific physical quantity or intensity is immersely proportional to the square of the distance from the source of the physical quantity. Today we're talking about the science of light. <laughs> <laughs> There's only one thing that we love more than eating food with chopsticks, and that's photography. <laughs> we are crazy. Yes, it's true. We are definitely crazy. But hey, today we are talking about the science of light. And in yes. fact, what we're talking about is the inverse square law. Now, before you hit stop on this video, because I said the word inverse square law, listen to us just for a second, and I guarantee you, you will want to see the rest of this video. So exactly. the inverse square law is one of those things that everybody hears about and they hear the words, I got to take these glasses off. <laughs> Here's about, that's much better. Here's about the inverse square law and they just go into the zone, right? Like, exactly. oh, I don't want to hear that. I don't understand. It's math class about. again. It's math. Yeah. But I tell you, Mark has a way of explaining the inverse square law that makes this so incredibly easy, something that anybody can understand. Yeah. Whether you've been at photography for a week or you've been at photography 10 years, one thing we yeah. found is that nobody understands it. They don't. So it's a, it's a key important thing um, for shooting with light. It is. It, it makes you understand what kind of light you need, what size of light yep. you need, where to place your light. Once you understand the inverse square law, which is easy to understand, it's all it good. It changes your world. It does. So let's do this. Let's go out, let's take a little photo walk. We'll actually teach you some lessons on inverse okay. square law that you can put into practice right away. So let's head on out and- uh, Let's go, let's do, do it. it. All right, so you see we don't have the uh, scrubs or the uh, scientists outfits anymore. <laughs> I like your outfit. <laughs> But anyways, uh, we don't want this to be scientific. This just needs to be simple and fun. So here's what you need to know about the inverse square law. Every time the distance doubles between your light and your subject, you're going to lose two stops of light. So here's what I mean. If I'm going to shoot a picture of Steve here, I'm going to put him, we, I would never do this, but he's going to be two feet away from my light right now. So I metered this earlier. I have him at F11 at a 200th of a second. So I'm gonna take a shot. And there's my shot of Steve. Now, what's gonna happen is, if I go two feet behind Steve, the light between Steve and two feet back, I'm gonna lose two stops of light in that two feet because I've doubled the amount of light. So if we move him back, I'm gonna go from F11 to 5.6. So I just, backed off two stops of light and I'm taking another shot of Steve right here and it should be the very close to the same exposure just simply because of that inverse square law I lost two stops of light now if now I double it again so he's at four feet if I double it to six feet or to eight feet I'm gonna lose two more stops of light so it's not every two feet now it's every time it doubles so now at eight feet I'm gonna open my lens up two more stops and I'm gonna get the exact same exposure. So I'll go ahead and take that. And you see, it looks the same because the exposure, I've just changed the exposure inside the lens. Here's where we get a problem. When we shoot groups of people, we tend to wanna to keep, which is nice because our light's softer, we wanna keep them crowded close to the light. So I might bring a family in, let's bring it right up to the line here. You're about three feet away. Let's say this was a nice big soft box and I'm shooting a, a family and I've got five members of the family. I got Steve here and maybe his wife stand next to him and I got some of his kids in the back here. Where I'm gonna run into a problem is Steve's only three feet away. When I take that shot, if one of his daughters are just a foot and a half behind him, they're gonna be at least almost a full stop darker than he's gonna be. So I'm gonna have a problem with exposure. So what you'll notice is we went from two feet to four feet to eight feet. That pocket of consistent light is getting bigger. So if I'm shooting a family, guess what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna move them away from my light quite a bit so that from the front person to the back person, they're gonna have a nice consistent, I can handle a half a stop difference or a quarter stop difference. 
So a lot of times you have to get people further away from your light with groups because we want to use that inverse square law to our advantage. The other place that it helps really well is maybe I want my background to be a little bit darker. I move my light closer to my subject. So if the light is only two feet away from Steve, he's two feet away from the wall. That wall is going to be two stops darker than he is. So if I want him to stand away from the wall, I just move the light in closer. So that's the practical way to use the inverse square law. You don't have to make it difficult. If you want to gain two stops of light, then all you have to do is get half the distance closer. If you want to lose it, all you got to do is move further away from the light. So every time it doubles, two stops of light. Simple. Very easy. Good. Ready to head back in? Let's do it. Okay. Talking raw. All right, so we're ready to do our Talking Raw segment. So and guess what? You finally have the chance. I finally get to eat. But, but before you get editing, did yes. you know that uh, when you go to a sushi restaurant and you get the ginger on the side, I used to do this too. You'd put it on your sushi. Yeah, that's not yeah, right. that's not the right way to do it. This is a palate cleanser in between pieces or you're changing types of sushi. So. It's a little Japanese intermezzo to refresh your palate. Mm. <laughs> so with that, let's... We were at a concert. All right, shot. so last week we did our show all about concert photography. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. We absolutely had a ball it's doing a it. But one of the things, I don't know if you remember, that we said there's two color, when we were talking about colors, there's two colors that we hate in concert lighting. Mm -hmm. The first mm -hmm. one is red, right? Terrible. The second one is blue. So what we thought it'd be fun to do is just show you how we can process or how you can't process some of these colors. So I've got one of the pictures of the drummer up here, Chris, from Eli Young Band. Mm -hmm. And as you guys notice, it's completely in red, right? Love I mean, photographing it. I've never seen a drummer that smiles. Oh, he's as the, a guy that loves what he does. He is happy. So. In fact, I, I said to him right before the show, I said, man, I love taking pictures of you because you're so happy. He's like, oh, I just love what I do. You yeah, know, it was, it was That's what cool. he said to yeah. <laughs> But uh, you can see that his face, his drums, everything are washed in red. So I don't mind red as long as it's a background color, but yeah. anytime the face and stuff are washed in red, it causes a big problem. So I've got this mm -hmm. open in Lightroom. And I actually, you know, it's a decent picture. His sticks aren't up, but, you know, just so you can see what's going on, his face is completely washed in red. Now, if we go down in Lightroom and we go all the way down to our color channels here, let me open that up real quick. There we are. And I'm going to go to the red channel, and I'm just going to try to reduce that red color. Yep. Watch what happens when I take that saturation down. He turned completely white. The only, his drums turn silver. Yeah, the only color pigment that I had was red. That's the problem with red. There's really nothing I can do. I can, yeah. you know, scroll back up and maybe play around with the, the color temperature, but watch his face. Like, yeah. It no matter which direction I move that, 50,000 or 2,000, yep. it's ugly. Right? And I'll I tell can, you what, if you did that too, because you're good friends with the lighting director, he'd have called you out too and he went, Steve, why are you turning my color. lights purple? Yeah, and it's you the know, wrong color. So, it's, it is. You know, yep. that's just one of those unfortunate things. When it's red, if you like the picture, leave it red. There's nothing you can do about it yeah. and just have a cool red picture. I had or, one shot that I did like that or, was red because it was rimmed out in red, but again, it Or what can we do? Hit black and white and we yeah. can change it into a black and white image. And it, usually those reds, because red actually translates into black and white for a good contrast does, picture. Yeah. He looks pretty good. Actually, that's a pretty cool picture in black and white. It is. So maybe black and white's what it is, but okay. you can always tell a concert that was shot with red light because it'll be a lot of black, black and white, and white images. Exactly. So that show was us your little raw talk, talking raw tips. for today. Get out and shoot a concert That's so right. you can play with these things. Fortunate questions. All righty, are you ready for ready. today's fortunate nice, questions? Nice delivery. Let's see if you can transfer. Oh, Look at that. Look at perfect that. Perfect balance. Now the whole thing, just eat the whole thing. <laughs> All right. Who do we hear from this week? From Don S. That's nice he put his little S on the end. Another one from Fresno. I think we had a Fresno a few weeks ago. We did. So Don says when We're running a- Big in Fresno. We are huge, 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 like huge. a wall. Uh, <laughs> Don says when running a photo business, is it best to focus on one type of photography or should you just be a jack of all trades? Yes. We should ask Jack, our photo intern, exactly. what's the best thing to do, but- <laughs> He would know. So what He's do you think, Mark? You know, this goes back to our our very first episode that we ever did of the Panopti Chopstick Show of the idea of should you pick a niche? That's right. It was niche photography. Niche photography. Um, you, here's the problem. The answer is not a simple one because you have to be a little bit of a jack of all trades these days because 
you're having to do a little bit of the graphic design, design the you're all, all those changing. things because just people don't want to pay for just photography. Yep. They want the editing, They a lot of times they want the layout, all kinds of stuff. And what we're finding is people are looking for video more and more too. Exactly, so, to, to supplement. I mean, that's one thing that we all, you know, and I struggle with the video. I think, you know, you're much better at video than I am, but it's just one of those things that's hard to like change your thought patterns. It so is. to answer Don's question, yeah, I think you kind of need to be that, but still, I don't want to see your website showing that you're a maternity photographer, a wedding photographer, a senior portrait photographer, a doggy photographer, yes. a funeral photographer, you know, a car photographer. Because you won't be good at any of them. No. You'll just be okay at all of them. So if you can focus on your wedding photographer, but it's someone that asks you to do senior portraits, go for it. Yeah, Make some money. But, yeah. but I think don't. I only know one person in my life that's kind of the, can be the jack of all trades. That, and I know, I know one guy that's like jack of all trades too and can do everything, I mean, including video, does stellar video, but... Yeah. I, I can't do jack of all, nothing. Exactly. <laughs> so. But as far as your business goes, you yep. really should be looking for areas that are a little bit more niche, but you should be a well-rounded photographer. But again, yeah, if you're wanting to make a living doing weddings, you need to specialize in being a wedding photographer. Yep. You might pick up some other work here and there, but yeah, yeah by... Be the best that you can in your area, in that niche. And... Yes. That's a good question from Don. I actually liked it. I actually liked it. You know what kind of photography I don't like doing? What's that? I know you don't like maternity, infant photography. It's not that I don't like it. I just can't. I'm not the baby whisperer. No. I can never get them to do what I want them to do. So anyways. All right. Good question. If you have a question that we want you to submit your question to us, you can either do it down below or you can send it to us at our either our website, panopticchopsticks.com or on our Facebook page. Good deal. Very good. We want to welcome you to our YouTube channel. That's right, the Panoptic Chopstick channel where we are bringing fun to photography. Hey, we want to invite you each week to join us on Tuesday, where we put out a new episode of our Panoptic Chopsticks show, where we will give you tips, tricks, interviews with photographers, we'll give you DIY projects to do on your own, and maybe even inspire you a bit. That's right, including always a little dash of fun. So we want to invite you to go ahead and subscribe and like our channel, where you will get notified every Tuesday of brand new episodes. But welcome to the Panoptic Chopsticks channel. Come join the fun. <laughs>